Okay, so we're talking about the torso and how to get the head and the neck attached. So that's a little tricky. Actually, let me pull up one more. And we talked about it last week and maybe even the week before. I can't remember. We're going to talk about it again. So when the figure starts getting into these dynamic poses, the problem we have, well, we have lots of problems because it's a figure, so it's complicated, but we tend to see the silhouette idea, the head, beautifully drawn head, and the shoulders. And so we see that silhouette. We stay on the outside. We're designed to, designed to do that. We want to know where the teeth are and how far away they are before they touch us. So we're very aware of the edge of things. As artists, we need to get inside a little bit track over the surface and feel a simple volume that breaks the silhouette. Notice if I draw a silhouette, it's flat. It's a shadow on the wall kind of thing. Until I can feel how to move over the form, preferably in both axes, long and short axes, I will not get a sense of its volume. And even if I do a quite crude job of that, <clears throat> we get a real sense of that. And it's one of the wonderful gifts of tone. Because if I have a shadow shape, then that is tracking over that form, perfect or imperfect form. Usually in nature, it's imperfect. <clears throat> it's tracking over that form. Uh, by its shape. It's a little trail that the ant has crawled along, like so. And if, the, if we then add gradation to it, Bear with me as I stumble through gradations on the computer. You guys are probably screaming to me on how to do it better. But if I add gradation to that, then it also moves us over the form. We'll feel the roundness of stuff. The gradation is told, telling us that it's turning more and more away from the light source or more and more towards the light source. And that light source then affects the value range. So we want our job as realist figurative artists, nothing else. If you're not a realist uh, artist, you don't have to worry about it. But if you want to get some realism in there, then you need to feel the volume, and that means in some manner or form, break the silhouette. No harder part or place to do that than getting the head, the most important part of our body, because that's how we contact each other when we look at each other, and the torso, which is the biggest structure of it. So if we look at a, uh, a figure here, we've got a profile of a head. I'm going to draw something as simple as I can, but as characteristic as I can. So I can get it down fast. So it's if I have to stop, I get a sense of it ringing true. I'm getting the point across to my audience. And I'm going to fit shape to shape to shape. And when I make a line, especially a long axis line, I want to make it curved if I can, because that's going to be the watery design that says life, that tells your audience that it's alive. Let me pop back here real quick. So if I move down the longest possible axis, the longest possible axis, 
and make it a little curved, it'll seem more alive. Sometimes I can't, but if I can, that's going to give that watery sense of life. So I'm just going to kind of sketch the stuff here for a second, and then we'll analyze it. Now, our primitive mind wants to go down the hair, down the neck, and shoulders and arms. And it wants to track over every little bit of it too. <clears throat> but we'll do that. The artist in us, the artist in us is a teacher. So our art is here to teach people how to see the real world and see it for what it really is and photorealistically what it really is or maybe what it is emotionally or maybe a little bit of both, which is where a lot of us realists are. We want to get it to look like a real figure in the real world. We want it to have a, uh, a sense of uh, solidity and uh, grounding to its environment and lit by real world lighting and that kind of stuff. And yet we oftentimes want it to be our own version of the reality. We want to make sure that uh, when people walk into the gallery, they notice that our pieces have something a little different, maybe not better or certainly not worse, but just different. Oh, that person, she's, when I see her work, there's something about that. And for a few of those folks, that's something about it idea will be exactly why they become fans of your work. There's something there. And one of those things that can be there is the watery, beautiful design. And notice as I'm drawing these things, if I really kind of carefully work it out, it'll oftentimes get a little tortured. So I'll oftentimes sweep it out to get the energy, because that's what I'm trying to get. There's energy that flows, meridians, chakra points, uh, nerve endings, whatever it is, scientifically or spiritual. Spiritually, there's stuff there where there's electricity going, spiritual or biological, or batteries, or conductors. So I want to feel all this stuff. And I can do it in a lot of different ways. I'm just going to kind of draw here for a couple minutes and not try and explain anything. just to give us something to work with. But try and get it energetic. And the more I can move those lines down the longest possible axis, even the shoulder line, that was the longest possible axis I could do to get the shoulders. The more I do of that, the more energetic, the more confident, the more um, uh, beautiful probably it will be because if it's tentative it's a little tortured it's a little nervous it's a little unsure and that might be exactly what you're trying to convey in your work but if you're trying to convey that that rich beautiful realism and confidently show us on the page here what is out in the real world over there oftentimes a sense of confidence gaining the confidence of your audience is important but as we work down there, it's going to get maybe a little out of proportion or certainly probably a little flat because we have to move down the long axis. But that, again, is flat like a shadow on the wall. We've got to then show them how to move over the short axis. So I think of the sides as two-dimensional, like a silhouette, or the full contour including the sides, <clears throat> is two-dimensional. But until I can get you off the contour, because if I take that out, you don't know if it's a capsule or maybe it's a tube that we're on top of, or maybe it's a tube that we're underneath. You don't know. But until I break that contour and show you how to move over the form, We're not going to feel the volume. And we can move over the form in any character 
you want, of course, square, round, cylindrical, or something that's square evolving into something that's round or whatever. <clears throat> so I think of the ends as three-dimensional, but not the outside ends. The ends, the construction lines that cut across, cut inside. So I'll probably want to draw a little bit of the structure this way. And when I do that, I'll feel more three-dimensional volume, but probably as I construct a cross, now I'm breaking it into smaller pieces, oftentimes constructing over where the landmarks are. Again, it can be square or rounded or both. And that'll oftentimes give me, that architecture will give me more proportion, and then I can correct and move along. So one of the things I'll try and do, I'm going to try and connect the head and the neck to the torso three ways. I'm going to connect it to the shoulder girdle, and that translates into the shoulder line. Let's just make this simpler. Out to the shoulder girdle. That's that most primitive of connections. But I'll at least break through the contour a little bit, even though it's not a three-dimensional break, by relating this side all the way through to this side over here, to that construction line. And I might add, have to add a few little pieces, lesser structures to make a satisfying connection. As I get more sophisticated, I can do that. So I'll get that head and neck to the shoulder line that will then sit on top in some way or another the torso, the ribs. <clears throat> I'll also use the um, shoulder line, not just to draw that construction line, which doesn't really exist, but to sh draw a simplified version. Let's lighten that up a little bit. Let's change your colors a little bit. A simplified version of the collarbone. Now when the arm goes up, oftentimes that collarbone gets lost, but we'll show a little bit of it there. It actually does show with a bit of light and shadow on there. So I'm taking it right down to the pit of the neck and just very simply, a simple curve to the pit of the neck or a simple S curve, whatever it is. And depending on the perspective, it can do any of those three things. But now I've got another inside out, and I'll notice that the collarbone is a little lower in there. And then that gives me the breastbone, if I don't already have that nice center line. And that tracks the direction it goes, the beautiful fluid curve, in this case, it's a stretch it goes, and helps to show me the facing dimension. Because when I get that center line, I instantly notice there's very little rib cage on that side, and there's a ton of rib cage on this side, and it gives me that facing dimension. So we have that one way to the shoulder line. And what I like to do is not have things break apart because that's not very graceful, and the human body give or take a pose, is beautifully graceful. But, so I'm not going to do a, the lollipop like this, or the, uh, the um, tin foil box for the robot uh, Halloween costume, say. But I'm going to take that head and neck and let it settle in to the shruggy muscle. And I think of it as a volcano with the top blown off. And we don't get to see that top because the neck breaks in front of it. And the volcano goes behind it. I 
right here, right here. Oops. So the neck comes down like a column. And again, it looks like a lollipop. It's not very graceful if we just think of it that way. So we always want to do two things, at least I do. I want to show the solid structure as it separates from other things, the rest of the world, the environment, whatever it is, foreground, background, light and shadow. I want to see how that particular thing is solid and beautiful and unique and uniquely separate. And then I want to reintegrate it. I want to separate it out. And then I want to blend it back together. That's called composition. We compose things, the separate things in some way or another are connected to each other. What seems separate to most people, to an artist, we know it's beautifully connected. Light is beautifully connected to shadow. And we have lots of strategies for showing that. Foreground is beautifully connected to background, and we have lots of strategies to show that. And so on. Organic can be beautifully connected to architectural. Abstraction can be beautifully connected to realism. Uh, the physical can be beautifully connected to the metaphysical, depending on your beliefs. So just like a spiritual strategy, which is all about connection, artists deal with exactly the same ideas, just clothed in different metaphors, uh, and very much the same, really exactly the same strategies of connection, the separate connected to the whole. So now I'm going to do a third connection here. I'm going to go from the neck into the ribs. And now I have an unseen connection. Neck into the ribs, neck into the volcanic shrugging muscles, neck into the boxy shoulder line, <clears throat> and so on. And each time I connect something, it's really wonderful. And I can't always do it, but usually we can. It's really wonderful if we can find several ways to connect that. And there's actually, there's way more ways than that, but that we'll just live with these for now. So another quick one would be the center line of the face, if we can see it, center line of the neck, to the pit of the neck, to the breastbone, to the belly button and crotch, connecting it through that central axis, that, that stream of current that takes us from the center of the features all the way to the, uh, to the crotch below. So lots of ways to connect. And now I have also several ways to double check. Is the shoulder wide enough? Is the neck long enough? Is the head turned away enough? Is, are we underneath the rib cage enough? And when I have several things to compare with each other and several ways to compare each thing to each other, now we can kind of lock down that idea and be more confident of where it fits uh, uh, or whether it fits. And doing all this careful work, it also leads me at least eventually towards an easier time of rendering because now I've broken down everything two-dimensionally and three-dimensionally. I've thought of things as boxes and oftentimes as balls and as tubes. And now I can start laying in my shadow and the shadow is just a product of the form. 
So if I'm very clear that how the form turns to the left or to the right, towards the top or towards the bottom, then I'll start to know how to light it because I'll know that the light source, and I'm going to stop and look before I start drawing or painting. Where is that spotlight? Where is the sun? I'll know the light source is maybe to the upper right. It's above and it's to the right. That means everything that turns down, light, light, everything that turns down will get dark, dark, dark. So now with some practice, with some help from the old masters, Now I can see see where uh, the breast turns away from the light source here. And notice how I wobbled that to make it a little imperfect. Because notice how incredibly simplified Everything is, it's just a line, that's the arm. Just a corner, that's a shoulder. Just an egg or a Coke bottle, that's the, the rib cage or the rib cage with the neck, and so on. I've reduced it down, I've distilled it down, which is one of my jobs as a artist, is to distill down the essence of reality and show you only the most important things of it. Even probably if I'm a photorealist, I'm gonna be leaving things out, even if it's just out of the frame. And so every time it turns down, here it's turning down, or to the left, there it's turning to the left. Here we're getting a little bit of the visual, uh, visible form turning to the left. So we get a sliver of shadow. And then here it turns down away, we get a little bit more shadow. This is blocking the rib cage from receiving light. And then here's where the rib cage, I'm going to let it wobble again. Here's where the rib cage turns away from light. And one of the tricks I like to do is that I should have done it here with layers. But I like to do the base of the shadow as a outline. The end of the shadow is just a line. The end of the shadow right here, just a line. And the beginning of the shadow is a soft edge, so I can render that soft gradation of half tone later. And that's one of the strategies for showing how shadow and light are actually are connected is through that gradation. So when something is interrupted from receiving light, I can make it a hard edge, even though there's no true hard edges in nature. And when it's the form of its own character turning out of the lights, then it's gonna be a softer transition. So I'll do a soft edge, it'll set me up for the rendering later. So, and then I can work all, my way all the way through the body parts. I know this is a tube. It turns away to the left from the light source and so on. It turns a little bit away. This turns a little bit away. Then it gets a little darker. It turns a lot away. It gets a lot, of, lot darker and so on. It turns down, gets darker and so on. On and on and on, work our way through. And we can then with some practice, I was gonna say a little bit of practice, but it takes more than that, doesn't it? takes really uh, uh, six lifetimes, I figure, to actually figure this stuff out. But we can do a pretty good job with one lifetime and even just a few years of one lifetime with a good system, some patience, and a tremendous amount of prayer. I'm joking on the prayer, although it probably wouldn't hurt. And where I don't do 
render tone, I can just use line. And line is a beautiful server of information that simplifies things radically. And we're very uh, clued into using line. And so I can put in line and people will buy into it pretty well. So that's how we work through that. I'm trying to find a way to connect several different ways. I do the same thing with the shoulder girdle. We won't go through all of it, but here's the arm, shoulder and bicep and tricep, let's say. I'll just draw it there, we won't get into explaining it. a little bit of work there so you can see it. <clears throat> There's the armpit there. At the base of the tone, I make it hard where it's interrupted. At the beginning of that tone where it's turned out of light, I make it more soft. And then that allows me to render it a little or a lot with, uh, with half tone. Like so, and if it turns a little bit away, it gets a little darker. If it turns strongly away, it gets strongly darker, and so on. And I just ease my way through, trying to make simple truths, simple rules, and then creative play with them. I'll make it this shape, no that shape. I'll make it a bunch of things, or no, I'll simplify it to a few things and slowly work my way towards that truth. So that shoulder girdle, as we call it, would be the uh, what holds the arm onto the ribcage. And we want to make, and I won't get, get into it, but we want to make several connective strategies, connective uh, um processes. One again would be same as the other, same as the head and neck, using the collarbone. One would be using the chest and or the breasts, one or both, and showing how that chest and breast sits on the rib cage, holds the Holds the arm onto the rib cage, like a shoulder, a football player's shoulder pads go over the top of the rib cage, strap onto the arm, same here. And then we would use the armpit coming back through off that same connection of chest back into the arm, going down the arm with anatomical ideas but it can just be structural ideas too. And it actually wraps around the outside. So it would move over here, although it gets lost in detail. So we could use that and there'd be others we could use as well. But now that's allowing us to pick things, uh, get control of things that might be complicated. For example, let's take that out here. How do I get that arm? Well, what if I thought of the arm is a tube and the shoulder as a ball and just be a drumstick well the problem with that is a couple things one that makes it kind of lifeless so we can always bring life into something by making the long axis curved <clears throat> that brings a little life into it. And it's not quite like a drumstick, like a xylophone kind of thing. Let me get rid of some of this stuff here. So that's not quite right. It's a nice simple, oops, I do that. That was cool. 
it's a nice simple idea, but it's not very characteristic of what I see. But what if instead I had a peg, I go to the gym to work out, there's a peg stuck in the wall and I drape my towel over the peg and it drapes around the other side. But there's only one side that's close to me. Well, that's pretty good for a chest, a little bit of chest with a collarbone, shoulder, and an arm. So let's think of that that way. So notice if I get really curious and inventive and say, well, I don't know how to do that thing. I don't know the Latin names and the anatomical insertions of that thing, but I know it looks like this. So I'm gonna draw that idea instead of that reality. I'm gonna draw my idea about the world, my idea of the world rather than the world itself, with some practice, because it's this kind of thinking, it's a bit of a language. Some practice, that becomes way easier than actually dealing with the world with all its complexity. I'm not gonna draw the arm with all its complexity, with all its Latin terminology and uh, kinetic energy and biology and physiology and all that kind of stuff. I'm gonna draw a curved peg and a very specific curve, maybe a beautifully wobbly lay, uh, a, um, peg, if um, I'm at that point in my craft, with, with a towel hanging over it. And I won't even see the other side of the towel. Or maybe I will and I'll go into the, the um, shoulder girdle latissimus or something. And then that makes life so much easier. So I spend all my time, really, when I'm doing my art, coming up with ideas to replace the real world. Ideas that distill it down, that simplify it, that make it more characteristic or make it more emotional. I do that. I draw my idea, not the thing. I can't get an arm on the page, but I can get my idea about the arm on the page. I can't get the laws of light on the page. I can get my idea of light and shadow on the page. And the clearer I get with my ideas, the more powerfully it speaks because I get rid of everything that doesn't support the idea. And I might get clever and add more than one idea and make it several ideas. I'm gonna use line and tone, light and shadow, foreground and background, architecture and some anatomy, structure and gesture. And as we get more sophisticated, we can play with more balls juggling in the air.